from Wakefield. It's the Nolan Car at Night Show, inviting you to join Nolan and his guest this week, Matt Hill, to the show. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's Nolan. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to yet another edition of the show. <laughs> and joining me this week, you know, I, I look back on my time in, in, in life and look finally on the moments watching TV on the weekends or, or during the week, if I was lucky to, and watching some pretty Good stuff. And joining us all the way on the Pacific West Coast is one of Canada's favorite sons, originally from Tawasin. This man has been gracing both the silver screen in your town and even your television screen in your living room for the past three decades, three and a half decades. You may recognize his voice as a seasoned four-wheeled automobile, a toy that spins from the top, a frog who likes to invent things, a red-haired bird, a cute and lovable <laughs> dog owned by three girls made in a lab, or a young skateboarder who hangs around big transforming trucks. But I know him as the voice of millions of kids' childhoods who happen to be the utmost senior intelligence leader when it came to all things butter toast. It is my high and mighty honor to have the man, uh, Matt Hill, as our guest this week. Mr. Hill, thank you for joining us. Uh, well, there, my friend, Mr. Nolan, is an honor um, of the butter toast kind and gravy, as well as uh, all the other of your favorite things uh, to be part of this uh, podcast. And, you know, like, thank you for that incredible rollout of of stuff i mean it's yeah. just like uh, oh my god just like it's been yeah. a good it's been a good ride absolutely sure. and, and, and the uh, ride's just gotten started yeah you know what for the for the 2.0 that's the yeah that's the beautiful thing you know now that uh you know we're, we're back being all together now after this uh you know this last couple of years um in the you know in a very very uh short uh post-pandemic world here yeah. you know, it's, it's awesome well, i'm sure for you so as I, someone who's in the entertainment industry and although nowadays people can stay from home and record in a home studio or the case may be to i'm sure see entertainment that you've not just you've been a part but just in general to be enjoyed again in person like it used to be is is an enjoyable thing oh absolutely you know i mean it's uh it's funny because doing say you know say a zoom um you know interview it's that's always had that incredible, you know, like zest to it. Um, and so I think as we had to sort of like, in a way, stay, stay away from each other for, for a couple of years um, now to be able to go back and be in a live setting with people, it's just like, you know, I'm, I've always been a huge hugger. So yeah. like, but, but now I'm like, I really hug people because yeah. I'm just like, Oh, I miss being with human beings, you sure. know? And <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's, well, um, it makes you appreciate the smaller things. I'm sure. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. The last few years has hopefully given us all time to reflect on ourselves, although sometimes those don't want to do that, and realize stuff that we didn't see about ourselves beforehand. So looking at the last three years, what did Matt Hill learn about himself that he didn't know prior? Wow, that is such a great question. Thank you for that. Um, it's a, Well, I've always known that I am a huge people person, um, but it confirmed uh, inside me that I'm an even more – people person um, because during sort of the COVID like two years, especially, especially those first two years, yeah. um, I actually ran uh, across Canada, but I did it locally where I live up here in, in Vancouver. Um, and so it was really wild to like, to be going like, okay, this sort of feels like it used to, but you know, not being able to say, go into say a studio and, yeah. you know, and, and, and be with, you know, the, the, you know, the voice artists and people that I love. And that I've worked with for, with all these years, um, it just confirmed that that inside me where I was like, okay, um, if I can't see everybody in person right in this moment, uh, you know what? When I do, uh, I'll be able to like like that. You know, like I said before, it's just like I I just find it's just like I'm I'm like really looking at people in the eye, you know, sure. saying like, hey, you matter, and yeah. you know, this life of ours really matters, and sure. you know, um, I I definitely realized. Yeah, I guess in many ways it was more of a confirmation that, you know, I mean, it's so I'm so grateful to be alive to begin with, yeah. right? It's, uh, you know, um, and then now when I'm getting to be back in person with people, um, you know, that same thing. It's just like all of a sudden I find myself I'm I'm like looking at them, and and like I'm looking and maybe I'm seeing them differently, but you know maybe I'm seeing them again for the first time. Sure. Like I just find myself saying that to people, going like, wow it's so good to see you sure yeah it's so good to be in person with you yeah. you know well you take and, uh, you, you take uh, advantage um, of it beforehand and not you know yeah. realizing it so now you get to appreciate the smaller things a lot of people have had on in the past in, in the states here people from the 
sort of sports media and news media in general world where they sort of have talked about how they would, you know, mute the television screen and do their own play by play for the sports or whatever the case mm-hmm. may be. So for you as some as a voice actor and actor in general, what was sort of on the television screen and movie screen for you growing up in your household that sort of led you either subconsciously or unsubconsciously to sort of do impressions that sort of led to your your career? Yeah, well, you know what? Um, I am that old that when I was a kid, there was this show called the Donnie and Marie Osmond show. And so um, it, it's for, it was like seeing those two on, you know, on TV every week. Um, I knew I wanted to be an actor. I knew I wanted to be a performer. Um, you know, we, we'd had this thing. I live, actually lived on a cul-de-sac when I grew up. Uh, and me and, the, you know, my friends on our cul-de-sac street, um, we used to like play these games, you know, underneath the streetlight and, you know, we called it monkey hour and, you know, and so like, you know, I, I'd always be like running circles around people on, you know, on my feet and they'd be on their bikes and, you know, then we'd have like variety show and, you know, so we'd all have these like different characters that we play and, you know, and um, the Partridge, do you remember the Partridge family? Well, no, you're I, just I, a baby. Well, I, I, like, I, I know uh, what's, I'm trying to think of the star of it. He was a singer. Oh, um, oh David Cassidy. Yeah. David Cassidy. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, like that, that same thing. It's like, I, you know, I watched that show and I was like, oh my God, I want my mom and dad to do, you know, buy yeah. a bus and like, let's form a band. <laughs> let's get our family out on the road. And, you know, it's so definitely those two, you know, genres and, and, and ways of sort of like lighting it up in the world. Um, I, uh, that, that for me, that's, that's sort of what set the journey, you know? I, I know that you're a big time runner and, and you, you had your, your fair share of memories early on uh, through your TED talk that I, that I watched talk about the first memory of track and how you got discouraged with, with a certain race at, at the beginning. But yeah. for you, you know, finding you started at a young age of 13, a middle schooler getting into acting for you. When did you realize, I mean, you mentioned the Partridge family, Donnie Marie Osmond. Did you, when did you realize that your skill level or talent was sort of leading in that direction? Uh, it's funny. My it was more my whisper. So like my, you know, it's like my, you know, my footsteps always took me places. So that's why for me, it's always been those three things, right? It's like running to get somewhere was always the thing that was just like I felt so free, right? Um, and so you know, from that first moment, my mom left the door open accidentally when I was I don't know maybe three, and I literally <laughs> busted to move out of the house, and you know, and and I I never stopped. Um, and then the, the life in, in film and TV, um, I guess it was around when I was maybe 11 or 10 or 11. Um, I just decided, you know what, I, if I'm going to be an actor, I better make this dream happen. You know, for some reason I thought at 13 that my life was half over, mm-hmm. um, but it literally lit a fire underneath me. And so I, I remember that day, you know, I'm like, all right, okay, I'm going to get an agent and I don't know how it's going to work, but it's going to work. And, you know um serendipitously vancouver was becoming a pretty big film center at that point well it was just like it was kind of the early days of it starting out sure. um so there was a radio um st- i'm sorry there was a, a radio commercial that i heard um of a place called jerry lodge talent agency mm-hmm. that they were taking on new actors for you know the the you know the burgeoning film and tv industry in vancouver um and so i was like that they're going to be my agent. You know, I just had this, like, I don't know. Sure. I, maybe I was just completely delusional <laughs> or it was dream meeting destiny. And I somehow connected with the owner um, who then somehow went, yeah, okay. You can come meet me on Thursday or whatever sure. it was. Um, and then uh, that, that certain morning when I knew I was going to have to take the bus into town, um, I told the biggest fib, which I called my biggest, you know, my greatest acting um, experiment in that moment. I convinced my mom and dad that I was too sick to go to school that day. And so, I mean, you know, we've all done it. You've done it too, right, sure. Noel? <laughs> so as soon as they left for, for work, I was like, and I sprinted for the bus, made the bus with five minutes to spare, you know, went downtown, um, and then sprinted to that first meeting with my first agent um, and literally arrived. And, you know, it was like that dream meeting destiny where um, – my first agent became, you know, basically my only agent, really. Yeah. Um, you know, and she, I remember her saying, she's like, do you have any talent? Do you have any experience? And I was like, nope, <laughs> but I really want to do this. And I've wanted to do this my whole life. And so essentially, here I am, you know, put yeah. me in, basically. And she, I remember my first agent, Dorothy Boyce, she was just like, oh, either I'm delusional or you got something, kid. 
she's like, I got a feeling about you. So I'm going to take a chance on you. And um, she said, okay, but if I'm going to take you into my agency, you have to take a course so that you can get better at your craft. Right. Yeah. So I'm just like, yeah, sign me up. And, you know, um, it's amazing because 30 years later, you know, I mean, it's uh, that, that moment because she took a chance on me, um, you know, and I never let her down. And, you know, yeah. um, I, I got my first professional gig three weeks after that course. And I, I ended up playing um, Santa's lead elf at the Christmas display go. downtown. So, you know, um, but, it, but it was amazing because I got yeah. to be able to pay her back for that course as well. Right. Yeah. Um, that, you know, a, so, you got to start somewhere. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and so like that, that dream got fueled. But then, you know, it was like once I crossed the finish line, it was like, OK, well, what else maybe could I do here? You know, sure. and, uh, um, you know, it's uh, that that's what blows my mind is like how fast 30 years goes under the bridge of time. You yeah. Know? I, I want to ask um, you about two people and, and moments. I mentioned the running and you in that same TED talk, you talked about your, your running coach, Judy Boeing and, and Terry mm -hmm. Fox, two influences on, on your life. Experiencing that, you know, you know, you, you're such a great runner early on. You're running from around the school. You're running around your house, around the neighborhood uncontrollably and, and at a successful rate. You make the track team. You finish last. That's an experience that I'm sure still sticks to you to this day. And at a time early on in, in your career starting out where you're getting roles, you're, you're getting jobs, but it's not consistent major stuff. How did those, you know, motivation aspects, the, the last place in the track event or Terry situation – inspire yeah. you to push forward and say i can act but it just will take time before i get some major stuff oh, it's such a great question because um that literally was that through line of these two paths that i mean thank god they they came to me at a relatively young you know um, time in my life um because as uh, as you were alluding to um terry fox uh was a one-legged runner who had had cancer in his leg and so in the 80s or in the late 70s um, you know, you lost a leg in order to save your life. And so, you know, I watched him running across Canada. Um, I guess I was about 10 and, um, I, there was something, it, it lit a fire inside me that just went like, you know, I was so in awe of him. Um, and I always wanted to do something that was in that same spirit to just give back to the world. Little did I yeah. know it would take, you know, 20, 30 years for that to kind of come to, sure. to fruition. Um, but then, you know, uh, my first like you know failure in my first track meet it absolutely changed everything because I went from feeling like I was the biggest loser almost like you know I went to my coach Judy right as you were alluding to saying you know I was like you know coach Judy you know I, I don't think I should be on the track team anymore and she's just like why so I'm like well I'm not very good I just I came I came dead last in my first race you know and and um she was amazing because she just said like just you know what how about this why don't I make you a deal? You try one more run. And if you don't like it, you never have to run ever again. Um, but she said, that's the only thing I ask of you. If you're going to quit the team, um, you know, just see, see, you might even yeah. start liking it again. And, um, you know, and uh, so I went for a run and uh, I fell in love with it again. Yeah, and, uh, there you go. It, it's still here. Oh, and then, you know, and, and I've had so many of those moments over the, over my life where, you know, I reflect back on that time and go like, wow, hey, Matt, all right, well, you, you face planted pretty good on that one. You know what? Just whatever, you know, what Coach Judy said, just try one more time. Sure. Get up, dust yourself off, try one more run, you know, and uh, um, it's, it's served very well, you know, not only for the runs, but then for, you know, this, this life that I chose as well, um, you know, because it's always been in the pursuit. I'm realizing a sort of like a bigger purpose while I'm here, but at the same time, you know, trying to basically go, okay, how can I bring this world of humans that I love so much together, yeah. right. To, you know, everybody to believe in themselves, to believe in the power of their, you know, their dream that that matters as well. Um, you know, and then that ended up leading to our run around North America, um, which is called run for one planet. And uh, you know, it, and it's, and it's amazing because even, doing that 11,000 miles, I, I thought of like those small steps that added up, sure. you know, with, with coach Judy. Right. So it's like my whole life has kept, it goes forward, but then I have all these moments to be able to go like, Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> just try one more time. Yeah. Okay. Get up that hill, <laughs> you know, <laughs> dust yourself off. Yeah. You know, 
And, uh, you know, it's, um, yeah, it served really well. A couple of years, I'll only say a couple of years, though, because, of course, you're only a few years older than, than myself. I think it's good. A couple of years, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. A couple um, of decades. You're, you're, um, <laughs> I'm, you're, I'm old now. <laughs> your first few roles, I mean, your television film debut, The Watchers, and um, The People Across the Lake and Captain N, The Game Master. Although <laughs> you're not maybe necessarily in, in those films the, the main star of, of all three in some aspects, to get that experience to be part of those, and especially Captain N, where there's almost 40 episodes of, of that program, mm -hmm. what was that like for you in terms of acting, and but also finding something to do and having some consistency and realizing that you sort of now you're you've made it in some aspects and now you can you know rely on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're com you're completely bang on, dude. Um, it was um because back in the day, like you know the classic Saturday morning cartoons that came out of you know for me, like you know Los Angeles, you know Universal City, Universal Studios that I didn't even know where it was except I'm like that's Hollywood. Oh my God, that's where you know this first cartoon that I did uh, as you were saying, Captain Nintendo. For me, that was sort of like the, you know, the, the, I don't know, the, the entryway into sure. that, that Saturday morning sort of, you know, um, entertainment side of things. Yeah. Um, and it was such a, it was such a blast, you know, I mean, I, I, I was horrible. I was like the worst voice actor to begin with. It was like, but, but same thing. I didn't have a lot of skill, but I had, but my passion was off the charts. You know, yeah. my enthusiasm to learn was there. Right. And uh, I mean, thank God I had, um, you know, all those cr incredible castmates and, you know, sure. great directors that just, you know, they were, they were awesome too. They knew I was new. So, you know, um, they, 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 they would just kindly go like, okay, well, that one didn't really work. Let's try it again. Sure. <laughs> you know? Um, and, uh, you know, like we all do, right. We all, yeah. we all get better over time, you know, and, sure. you know, the more we practice, the more we get to, you know, do our craft, exactly. right? you know? Um, so it's been a, yeah, it's been an incredible journey of like learning curves and like you know chapters and miles and sure. you know it's just like you know it's like funny because like every time let's say i um like I, ha I have to fly to um an animation convention in a couple months that's what always blows my mind that like say you know in this case i'm flying to um uh to to, to detroit right or to florida the number of hours that it takes to fly that's what took us in months to run across yeah. Canada and around the States. So it's always this, you know, I'd be looking down going, Oh my God, you know, we're going over like, you know, Duluth, Iowa or bad, <laughs> that, that's a, but you know what I mean? Like somewhere sure. on along our route or like, you know, going across Toronto, you know, over Toronto. And I'm like, that took us five months to run there. <laughs> I just flew here in five hours. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like, so there's, it's been a neat way to be able to now frame the continent for me, sure. right? You know, and, uh, you know, and, and have it be steeped with all these incredible in school, you know, presentations and stuff that we did with the kids and, um, you know, um, and then in the gift of having chosen this, you know, this craft of, of acting to then have, you know, two of those really classic characters in Raphael and in, and in our buddy Ed, um, to be able to go in and inspire all these kids in these presentations. Sure. Um, it was, it was a, it truly, it was a game changer for us, you know, yeah. um, you know, cause our tour was run for one planet, which was the run to inspire environmental action. Right. Sure. So that's why we went into the schools and we used the, the metaphor of the marathon, small steps adding up. Right. Um, but then being able to say, you know, go into the, you know, presentation of like 2000 kids and their teachers and, you know, be like, Hey, yo, 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 you know, so-and-so, you know, high school who wants to save the planet with Raphael and, you know, sparkly Stephanie. Cause that was my partner at the time. And, uh, you know, and my buddy Ed too, you know, and like literally in front of me, I, it was like instant feedback loop of like 2000 kids and teachers going like, yes I'll, you know we'll do we'll do anything just keep you know like you know and and, and it was funny because i didn't even want to use the cartoons or sure. any of these rules to to say to to speak this message because sure. i didn't want to maybe hoodwink the kids you know going like yeah. hey, hey kid hey yo it's uncle raf and you know you know take some action challenge here and make the planet a better place but then we realized this was the catalyst to make sure. that that um that difference right sure. 
you know, because it's these two characters in particular that were so ingrained and in people's hearts yeah. and in their, you know, and in their daily um, experiences growing up, right? You know, yeah. it's, it's like, I mean, the amount of like, you know, like even teachers that came up to me and were like had tears in their eyes going, never don't think that like the Ninja Turtles absolutely saved, you know, my life or helped me be on a better path. Sure. I remember one teacher saying he chose to be a teacher because watching Ed, Ed, and Eddie made him feel like a part of a club. Sure. Right. And, and the code of like the brotherhood of turtles, as an example, yeah. you know, it, it was these incredibly positive messages that I went from, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I was so grateful being an actor because, yeah. you know, being an actor, you get a job that's success. Right. Yeah. But, but, but having this like instant feedback loop, of all these in-person experiences in these schools is, you know, yeah. I was crying sometimes going, you know, because people would be crying going like, you literally changed my life because these characters meant so much to me or, you know, mean so much to me. Right. And I yeah. was like, Oh, wow. You know, like it, it, it took the depth level of, of um, the gratitude of being in the moment with people, yeah. you know, it's yeah. a, like I still feel it's the greatest gift. Ed and Eddie was nearly on for was nearly ten years of, of the yeah. show. Where some yeah. shows at that point maybe were only for around a year or, or a season or got canceled. So for you, being part of something that had the potential to last many seasons or many years, was that mm -hmm. important for you back then, or was it something that you just were lucky to get if that happened? Yeah, well, it's both, right? Because obviously, as an actor, we're pay for play, right? So every time you get to go to the studio. It's like, oh my God, I get to go to work. Yeah. Oh my God, I get paid to do this. Oh my God, they bring lunch, yeah. <laughs> right? And so it was like, for an actor, it's just like if, every time you get a, a new show, it's always, um, especially up here in Canada, it was based on um, per episode, right? And so, um, because we don't have residual system up in Canada. So Ed, Ed Nettie is an example. You know, we were just super grateful um, at the heart of it that it just was so popular. Sure. But I had no idea how popular, <laughs> like like zero idea yeah. how popular until, like I said, we went on Run for One Planet, and you know, you know, fifty thousand kids in all these schools going, we love Ed, <laughs> you know, um, and then now even up to this moment now with the inception of Cameo, um, yeah. which is that same thing. It's just like getting to be, you know, able to, you know, bring Ed into people's uh, lives. Yeah. by way of giving them a personal video which you know again for me it's just like <laughs> thank you so much you know it's like it's it's such a gift sure you know um and so in answering your question to say for an actor the longer it went obviously the more you're going to be employed the longer sure. you're going to be employed so that so that was a, a good thing um and and sometimes you have no idea right i mean some sure. shows that you know, they get all this press, right? And they're gone after sure. you know, I've been on lots of them, right? Where they didn't even get aired. Yeah. Um, you know, but for some reason, let's say Ed Ed Netty is an example. It was the incredible genius of um, Danny Antonucci and the yeah. creative team um, who just, you know, he's he's genius. He yeah. like, he everything was up here, right? And so that's why sometimes it was so maddening to to, to record but it was not a show that we ever, ever didn't feel proud of because sure. like Danny is the creator, we'd sometimes, we wouldn't let a take go until we got it right. Sure. Right. And so, um, you know, cause in an animation, there's a lot of time where you come back and you fix a whole bunch of scenes later yeah. on. Ed Ed Nettie was the show, one show I worked on. We never had pickups. Oh, wow. We never had to fix stuff. And that was again, cause you know, in the session, Danny would be like, no like you know all of us heard all the time it's not ed <laughs> you know i'd be like oh yeah but okay but okay uh, i'm ed he's like yeah do it like that <laughs> right and uh oh you know it's like uh um like do, do you know how i ended up getting finally got ed no how, how that happened the uh, we had about eight callbacks um which is kind of unheard of as well right we always usually have like maybe two callbacks sure. and then you get the gig um, Ed, Ed and Eddie, I think we went officially eight callbacks oh, wow. and we sort of knew we were getting closer when it went from like having like 16 people in the room or in the waiting room to like, there was me, Sam, Tony, 
and then the the other and then the rest of the cast and and maybe two or three other people that we all got called in to do the scene uh and we sort of knew we were getting close as people sort of like didn't get invited to stay sure right and so this fine thing was like i think it was like callback number eight we're i mean finally you know i'm looking around we're you know and and i mean poor danny because like i said he knew what he wanted but he was just like this is all i saw i couldn't hear him but apparently (laughs) he was just like oh what when am i gonna hear what i need to hear and i remember just out of frustration because i didn't know i literally did and you don't do this as an actor ever i i I had this idea and i just went oh excuse me fellas and i and i and i looked up at the microphone and i and i tapped on it so you heard this you know boom boom you know the engineer's about to kill me through the glass and then i go um excuse me uh how do you get water from this thing here (laughs) Right. And I and I couldn't hear what Danny's response was. And and inside the glass, he was going, oh, my God, that's Ed. And he's looking at the engineer going, did you get that? Like, did you have that recorded? Right. Yeah. And that's all I heard was. <laughs> right. I, and I thought, oh, boy, they're going to yeah. get security. I'm going to get hauled out of here. Literally. So the engineer comes in and goes, I got it. Don't ever blow in the microphone again. Or I'll kill you. <laughs> and he goes. And then and then I hear Danny going, play him the thing, play him the thing. Right, so you know, play it back, and I hear this. Dum, dum, dum. Uh, skills, my fellas, how do you get water from this thing here? And Danny was like, "That's Ed. If you do that, you got the gig, right?" And uh, so for the first thirteen episodes, every time I was getting out of Ed, you know, they'd be like, "Ah, play him the thing, play him the thing," right? And so I'd hear that, you know, I'd hear yeah. that mistake, yeah. right, which actually scored me the gig of yeah. my life. You know, it's just like a, a happy accident, as Bob yeah, Ross would say. Exactly. Yeah. You know, um, in the early nineties, ninety three is when your life changed yet again, as you got a a a, a, a decent sized part in a little known movie called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, number yeah. three as, yeah. as Raphael. Kind but, of a small series. Nobody's probably yeah. really heard of it. Yeah, really. it's it's mm-hmm. not like that. They've yeah. had they they've had other things afterward, anyways. Um. For that role, prior to when you got that, where were you in terms of your believing yourself as an actor and in confidence level? And then did you at any point feel that, oh, my life's going to change a little bit with the, with projects like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Um, yeah, once again, I wasn't a, I wasn't a um, well, the internet wasn't invented yet, but I wasn't and um, I didn't like read the industry papers. Sure. But um, aware, I, you know, I mean, I was obviously aware enough that I knew that the turtles were, you know, like they were a pretty popular um, franchise. Um, but again, I had no idea. Um, I just wanted another gig because sure. you're an actor, you get the gig, you're working for another bunch of months. And so, um, and this one was really, I was super stoked about it because, you know, obviously I love being athletic. And so, um, when I found out pretty early on that if I got the gig. I would I would have to train um you know to to do some martial arts um because even though there's world class martial arts that they have for all the big fight scenes yeah um there was essentially there was the um there was the stunt turtle and then there was the martial arts turtle and then there was the you know they call it the talkie turtle right so because you know we had the animatronics in our head sure um but it was so cool because that first audition they gave us they said two things they said we're gonna put a paper bag over your head when you audition. Cause we want to see if you can still act being, <laughs> I call it blind, deaf and dumb um, because we literally were going to be, you know, kind of having to act the scene out sure. kind of like Kabuki theater. So everything was really big. Yeah. Um, and then they said, watch the first movie as an example to the scene. Um, and so, you know, I got to watch that classic scene with Casey and, and Raph, you know, where he's like, Oh yeah, it said all you got a whole zinc and cycle bat. Right. And, <laughs> So I watched that scene over and over and over because that was the that was the scene that I was going to audition with, uh, and so it was beautiful because I knew it. I knew it, you know, like I knew it the best that yeah. I could do it. The only thing I knew I didn't know is if they needed me to do a backflip. Uh, technically, I didn't know how to do a backflip, <laughs> but there was something inside me that went okay. At the I think it was maybe the second callback. Um, they asked. I I just had a feeling that they were going to ask that day, going you know, because I had a feeling that that they were liking what I was doing. Sure. And, uh, and I remember, you know, David Lamb, the producer, he's just like, uh, yeah, I uh, do, you know, do you know how to do a flip, right? And I was like, I think he said flip. And I was like, yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, about that. I'm like, I'm like, guys, if you want me to do a backflip here, I can. You know, I said, but it's a kind of a small room. And thank God it was a small room that we were auditioning in. But I faked it and just said, hey, but 
how about I do a world class back like a a, a round off, and then you know do, and then so I you know I've been practicing some martial arts already so it was brilliant I guess I showed him enough that you know so I did this running you know round off that made it look kind of flashy <laughs> I'm not very good <laughs> uh, but it was enough for them to go yeah okay we buy him as Raphael yeah sure. you know and uh, and then the training began yeah. and man I just I got <laughs> I got kicked and punched and you know. <laughs> Like, you know, I think I passed out three or four times by hitting myself with my own, um, you know, the size that sure. Rap's got, <laughs> you know, because I'm not a martial artist, but, you know, it sure felt like it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, that, um, you know, but then once again, now fast forward to then filming that summer, um, being inside the turtle suit felt like such a natural progression right. in my life in terms of, say, you know, this movie. I still had no idea how popular it was yeah. until we had these little breaks on set. And, you know, my, my um, puppeteer, Noel, um, who's the um, puppeteer for um, Snuffleupagus on um, oh, Sesame yeah. Street. Um, <laughs> I'd hear him in my, in my, um, you know, my earpiece. Cause you know, this is 1990s technology, right? Sure. So all I heard was like, Mortars smashing together, uh-huh. servos. So it was just like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then I'd sometimes hear Noel, you know, going, uh, Maddie, um, there's a there's a kid on your lap, and parents are on each side or whatever. Because we'd be sitting there, I'd be inside just trying to catch a breath, sure. and then they'd be filing all these fans in that had been waiting to have a pick with the with the turtles. Sure. Um, and so like I got my first taste of you know, because like I you know they take that the head off sometimes. And then I'd look around and be like, whoa, we're popular. Air. You know, it was, oh, yeah. It was, you know, it was kind of like one of those light bulb moments going like, oh, I think I understand now. Yeah. Okay. You know. Like, now, uh, a few years after, about six years after that, you took part in probably the, the one of the greatest <clears throat> evers of cartoon and animation ever at, as with another little known project called Ed, Ed and Eddie, where you stars on the three titular characters. For you to be part of that, and you said how in the moment you probably didn't know that it was going to be as successful as it was until much later mm-hmm. on. Yeah. To have sort of made, looking back on it perhaps then, as seeing as you made it sort of to that mountaintop where you're part of this era where there's all these other great projects coming out mm-hmm. at that point, to then mm-hmm. be part of an equally great project for nine years and a few movies, a few spots, and other oh. um, programs. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like to reach that sort of mountaintop and re- look back and say, oh, my gosh, I was part of this era of, of television for not just yeah. adults, but also kids as well. Oh, absolutely. You nailed it. It's like is there's a um, there's a sense of um, pride in uh, and almost like confirmation of the choice that I made when I was 11. Right. And then at 13 going like, all right. It's Thursday. Today's the day. I'm, you know, I'm taking the bus to my destiny, my dream. And, sure. you know, I did my first, you know, Oscar winning performance, you know, convincing mom and dad that I was too sick to go to school. Yeah. Sorry, mom and dad. <laughs> uh, but then, but that literally was my destiny meeting, you know, dream um, vehicle, right? Yeah. So then now being part of these shows in the, in the, like you're saying, in the 90s and, you know, and into the 2000s was just like, um, you know, I, I just always say like, nice job, you know, well yeah. done, you know, choosing that as a, as my career, you know, yeah. it's, um, I felt, I feel very, um, I feel very honored, you know, yeah. um, and, and also the, 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 the fans that have also, um, you know, some of the, some of the words that people say, sure. and, you know, and, and I mean, that means a lot to me, right. Sure. It's like, because, you know, that, that's like why I, why we're seeing like on run for one planet when, you know, and even at animation conventions, it's that same in-person experience or interaction where it's like another human being going like, wow, yeah. it's so awesome to meet you. And, you know, thank you for helping me get through a tough childhood or yeah. you know, thank you for, you know, all the ways that, you know, say Ed made me feel that I wasn't such an outcast. Sure. Right. Or, you know, Raphael making me feel like I was part of my own posse, you know, sure. and. Um, you know, it's like, I never forget like that. Um, like I was saying that there was a like really tall teacher in this one school in, in, um, uh, in Texas, I think it was Houston. And, uh, and, and he was, and I found out why he was so tall. Cause he was actually, um, he used to play in the NBA. <laughs> I can't remember his name, but, uh, but he, he's a significantly tall man. Yeah. And, uh, and he was basically the uh, principal of this whole school. It's oh. called the charter school. 
So there's like, I think it was like 2,500 kids. Oh, wow. And they run it like a military college so that all these kids learn from beginning to getting out of school, yeah. you know, respect for themselves, respect for others, respect for teachers. And, um, and so it was very, it was very formal to begin with. And, you know, originally we were thinking, oh, okay, I don't know if they're going to like us very much. <laughs> But the second I busted into, you know, hey, yo, 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 you know, Houston Middle School, what's to say the blood with Raphael, <laughs> right? And then as soon as I said, you know, and, and, and too, right? This, this really tall, you know, um, principal, literally, I'll never forget, he was just like, oh my God, no, no way, right? So I literally played to him for a couple seconds going like, my name is you too, yeah, young man. And, um, and, and it was amazing because he waited in line because um, all the kids, would always wait to, you know, get our autographs, you know, they'd be like, you know, Ed, sign my arm or, you know, say, you know, write sparkly, you know, butter or whatever. Right. And, <laughs> and this teacher or sorry, principal, I found out later, he waited till everyone else had gone through. Um, and when he got up to me, he literally gave me the biggest bear hug. Uh, and, you know, and he said, Hey, I just want you to know, thank you because you doing this has made such a difference to our kids but he also he wanted to say thank you for Raphael in particular helping him to you know learn the code of of you know being a good person because sure. I said you know he'd said he grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood um but but watching the ninja turtles he said just set him on a course that that's why he decided he wanted to be you know an educator sure cuz he, he he believed in what the turtles were saying you know like help an old lady cross the road yeah you know, do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, you know, yeah. like live with your own set of personal code of honor. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, like I said, we're I got that day in, day out on the tour, you know, of, and then with this, you know, this guy saying like, you know, um, like, don't ever think you didn't impact these kids as well sure. as this big kid right here. He said, yeah. right. You know, so, you know, another big man hug yeah. and you know, I got lifted off the ground because he's like seven foot eight. <laughs> I'm five, five and a half, yeah. you know, uh, but but it so it's just this oscillation of incredible positive energy that sure. that's where I feel as I move forward, um, especially from the tour forward, you know, through more more acting, more, you know, roles to then now sharing my voice, doing my keynotes. It's a it's a really again it's it, i haven't really gone anywhere i've just it's a it's a beautiful way to um i guess evolve the message i guess sure, sure. Right? And, and stay grounded as as yeah. well uh, it, but the thing is though no one I mean, although you're a very humble guy and re respectful guy uh, as, as well but who else could play the toast loving soliloquy speaking canker sister fearing level ed besides yourself no one well, uh, that's where I say thank you, friend. I, you know, and and, and like I said, I, I think it was uh, it was destiny meeting that that you know that mistake. Um, yeah. I'm doing that on the mic because, like I said, I know then and there. That's when Danny went like, "That said, thank God I finally yeah. can now cross off another of these characters." You yeah. know, because he was trying to cast this show. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, so yeah, I'm forever grateful for that. You know, because I'm, um, I'm curious with with the show and i you said in other interviews how it wasn't even on in canada um mm. when the u.s it was on for that though when you first came to the u.s maybe mm. if it was when the show was on or afterwards when you when you realized and said oh yeah oh i was in ed and ed, ed, it was ed mm. and it mm. was as you said <gasps> was there any more of that while the show was going on or was that more of just when it was over um more so for me personally when it was more getting over because that, like I said, literally the, it was, I couldn't have, it couldn't have been, um, timed better. Let's just call it that as we were about to take off on our year long run around North America, sure. we started from Vancouver. Right. And so, and Ed, Ed, Nettie was recorded in Vancouver and literally the last year, um, you know, when they started, we started the, the first episodes of that final season, they said, this is going to be it. This is going to be our it's going to be our last, you know, our last season doing Ed, Ed, and Eddie. I thought originally that I would go and do the tour and then have to come back and, you know, do more Eds. Um, so it just kind of worked out perfectly in that respect because, sure. you know, again, I mean, we knew it was super popular because, you know, we'd, we'd done so many seasons by that point. Sure. Um, but I I hadn't been to a, uh, I think because I didn't go to a Comic-Con um, until we went on the Renfrew and Planet Tour. Uh -huh. 
Um, and so for me, like I said, it was, it was when we finally, um, you know, kind of in a way we're forced to use these cartoon characters to, you know, to make the kids laugh and, sure. you know, feel connected. Um, you know, for me, that was, that was the game changer. Right. You know, and then, and honestly, especially when we got into the States to be able to, to literally bust out and, you know, say, you know, who wants to save the planet with Ed, sure. <laughs> you know, and it was a game changer, yeah. you know, um, cause also too, that was when the economy had melted down yeah. in 2008. Right. So it was really tough times, you know, like getting into the States, um, we thought it was going to be the opposite, right? Because the economy had been on fire and then all of a sudden crash and they literally whole towns were for basically for sale or in yeah. foreclosure. So it, it and so it, it really, um, for, a, for a bit, it really thwarted our, because, you know, we, we were thinking we were going to raise a ton of money, right, for our Legacy for Kids fund. And, uh, but we realized pretty quickly that we had to rejink and go, okay, or rejig, I mean, saying, you know, all right, let's treat every kid like they're worth a million dollars, spread this message, um, you know, and whatever anybody could afford to, to donate, sure. that's, that's what we went for, right? And, um, and, you know, and so, but it, but it had a, that special spirit to it too, right? Sure. You know, I mean, there's, there, I mean, we went through this one town called Chocowinity, North Carolina. I'll never forget this. The probably the poorest town that we had run through, the incomplete, you know, even the teachers said the whole town had been thrown out of work. Um, and then especially then now with the um uh with the economy and melting. Um, but these kids, I, I love her. She said, these kids never get a big tour like you guys. And I thought, oh wow, we're you talk we're oh, okay, well, guess we're a big tour. Oh, right? But it, yeah, exactly. But it was really beautiful because she said these kids never get things like that because right. the school couldn't afford even in the best of times because it was just a little community school i mean there yeah. was maybe 500 kids maybe but she said these kids are so special so we literally we ran for about 30 days in a row in order to make this one event um because also too it was right around christmas time and you know thanksgiving and you know the big u.s election you know when obama got in nobody was sort of booking you know schools along the east coast except for this one school that that booked us a month in advance and so you know we like ran to make this event and um the the teacher told us that for about a week before we arrived the kids decided to go around to the entire community and they were all saying you know run for one planet's coming to school could you help us raise some money for their legacy for kids right and you know so this poor school that most of the parents are on food stamps because they they had no income for a bit um mm -hmm. raised i i think per capita they raised more than any other school that it, oh, wow. you, you know you know and again it it, it just showed the power of the sure. of the human being was you know that that for me was it's like the power of the human spirit is alive and well and, sure. and in those moments it's all it's where it's so evident as well yeah well i just all had right. a thought I'm, i remember what you were saying with some of the other people that i've met that have been knocked out because they you know because i'm part yeah. of it and going to some of the conventions that's what's been cool because like you know I've, like i i was sitting next door to um uh lou ferrigno yeah. um who's the, you know the hulk right yeah and you know and i'm going like oh my god that's the hulk <laughs> right and then so you know as we all get introduced because we're all sort of in the same green room area together and all this and you know my my um somebody said oh yeah and this and this guy's you know he was Raphael on the voice of ed as soon as he heard ed you know he's like you you had right <laughs> i was like you bet your sweet pippy right <laughs> and so it was so cool because like you know my childhood hero the hulk yeah. is going oh do it do it do more ed you know butter toast butter toast <laughs> right and it's just like you know and then we're taking pictures together and yeah. you know and yeah i had that quite a few times where you know um god like morgan fairchild you remember her from apparently her grandkids loved ed ed nettie Right. right so you know same thing i'm you know i was 13 and she was on tv and i'm like she's so beautiful still and and you know and then she's oogling going like um is it okay if like could you just sign a a photo for you know for my grandkids yes okay yes i will and i was like yes you yes i can pretty lady i can't look at you right now because you know you're so pretty <laughs> you know and but but just it, it that's where i felt like again that same thing because yeah. of the connection through the work that we all get to do 
yeah. that's where it's just like you know uh it's you know um i mean on the rock and roll side of things like you know you know queen right yeah well brian may right very incredible guitar player yeah. well you know um a movie i got to be a voice in um called a monkey's tale uh we premiered it in england because it was actually produced and and recorded in england and at the premiere um it was perfect again where i'm you know i get out of the um uh whatever the taxi that i went to the you know the the premiere in and in front of me was you know brian may with his yeah. with his three kids two kids three kids um and i'm like fanboying behind going like oh my god that's brian may oh my <laughs> god that's oh my god that's what right but i'm just like you know and you know, and it was great because the you know, paparazzi's taking all these pictures of him and his kids, you know, and he's just like, all right, guys, you know, come on, take one and, you know, you know, move on sort of thing. Yeah. And I'm in behind not realizing that we're going to the same premiere. Yeah. And then, um, you know, fast forward, like, you know, an hour later um, at the after reception thing, um, I could literally I get this tap on my shoulder. Right. And so, you know, I'm just like turn around and, you know, there's this like this this tall structure beside me. Right. And so I, you know, follow the gaze up and then at the bottom of there, it's it's Brian May. <laughs> right. And he literally with like the kindest, genuine person he is, yeah. took my hand and he said, he's like, hey, oh, yeah, you're the you're the character. Huh? Because they introduced us, you know, us as the characters yeah. after um before the movie. Sorry, I forgot to say that. So, you know, my my childhood god, you know, rock god hero, um, you know, comes over to me afterwards and just says, you know, man, you did such a bloody good job, man. My kids were laughing. You made, you know, so essentially like, you know, thanks for thanks for doing such a great job in this role of calm. Yeah. You know, and I'm just like, oh my God, thank you for being Brian May and like, oh my God, you guys are amazing. <laughs> you know, and uh you know, so it's neat. It's just yeah, a, it's an incredible thing. I, 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 you just said it, so I have to ask you again. Please say you bet your sweet, sweet bippy. I did. Did I, I, I say you bet your sweet bippy? Yeah, I have to hear it again as a. Oh uh, yeah. Oh, you bet your sweet bippy. You will bet your sweet bippy. I did. Mentioning the the, the knowing of, of you, I am guessing the little that I know of you, you seem as though you're not going to stop doing it anytime soon. At a hundred years old, you're still going to be working to an extent. For you, is is there a type of you know show or movie that you would like to be on, or one from the past or present you'd like to have been in? Oh, hundred percent. Um, it's uh, um, it's actually funny. Like it was a few years ago, but um, uh, they were doing they had written a script which was like a classic four episode miniseries uh for the Ninja Turtles. Yeah. Um, that was literally going to be them fifteen years older. So, you know, Raph had his own security company, you know, I think Donnie had a pizza shop, um, you know, um, Leo uh, had like a, I think he had a martial arts studio in the script. Donnie had was like a scientist, um, you know, working at a tech firm, but they were, so they were all out in their turtles living yeah. amongst everyone in New York. Right. And I thought that would have been the coolest way yeah. to get back in the suit. And, um, and yeah, and they reached out and, you know, so we were, I was literally about to go to London um, to go uh, to the creature shop uh, to go get the next fitting of the next version of the, of the classic suit. Yeah. And then um, I, I believe it was ABC that was going to do it. And then they, um, for whatever reason, they, they pulled it and they yeah. didn't, they didn't end up doing it. So that would have been one that I think would have been really fun to revisit. Um, and then, you know, like the other ones, it's just like, like you just you you know you mentioned um you know uh, dino trucks, like same thing for me. Hunton had that same energy as Ed. That sure. those two characters, I, if I could have done those two characters till till I'm 104, yeah, that's because that's my birthday. That I I don't know for some reason I always think like it'd be amazing to be 104 years old on my birthday and either be going for a run that day or running to the studio and doing my last session <laughs> um or you know passing away from this life you know on my way to a sure. session or you know um or you know the proverbial last you know lap of the track of my life exactly you know? yeah now before mm -hmm. we end here today and again matt thank you so much for doing this i want oh, to end on, on, on a little game called the one word yeah. challenge so what entails oh. with this is that i'll throw a few names of people places or things that have some connection to my guest one word challenge you said yes yeah, so either okay. a word or two or sentence whatever you care because you're matt hill and you're, okay. you're the legend that it is uh whatever comes to mind when you hear it uh first one uh 
Tawasson. Hometown. Uh, Los Angeles. My happy place. Voice acting. Very sparkly. <laughs> Movies. So good and so powerful. Hard work. Yes, indeed. Success. Love it. Ed. He is a good, good uh, person. I mean, uh, cartoon character. <laughs> uh, Raphael. Yo, yo, yo. Uh, hey, believe in yourself and the power of your uh, personal code uh, of awesomeness. Sorry, Terry, I cut you off. No, no, sorry. Uh, Terry Fox. Ah, uh, our greatest Canadian. And uh, yeah, I got. Uh, yeah, our greatest Canadian changed my life at 10. Uh, and last but certainly never least in this cosmic universe we all called Earth that we live in, Matt Hill. Oh, uh, it's been very, it's been an honor to be here, everybody. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever works works for you. Well, well good, sir. I want to say thank you for taking the time oh. to do this. It was a, a great trip. And as someone who grew up with a lot of this stuff, this was a, a real thrill for me. Well, and it's as much a thrill and an honor for me too, dude, because like, um, I'm hoping you're getting incredible um, thumbs up from people because it's that same thing. What you've put together since you started this thing. Yeah. You know, it's like that. It's like, it's like, Hey kid, you, you obviously doing something right. <laughs> you know? So just yeah. keep being you because uh, you know, that's uh uh, well, also too, I love your back screen too. That's a very, very cool. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, the, uh, the the posters that I yeah, yeah, yeah. I have. But, um, but but truly, man, thank you for reaching out because well, um, you know, this is uh, I feel uh, feel honored that um, you know you would you'd want to chat for an hour. Yeah. All those out there enjoyed it because who the hell wouldn't? And down the line, when my guest Matt Hill gets inducted into the voice acting hall of fame, you can say, "Holy shit, I subscribe!" So come and share, subscribe, <laughs> yeah. all that fun jazz. Because who the hell like, wouldn't? Holy shit! Holy, <laughs> but, can you say holy shit? <laughs> you can say whatever you want. You're you're you're, you're the man of the hour. Uh, follow on Twitter, Nolan Car Knight, and Instagram, Nolan Car Knight Show for all news and updates regarding the podcast. And in the words of Johnny Carson, the dean of talk shows certainly like this one. I bid you all a heartfelt good night. Till next time, we speak again.